right. Well, for decades, one name has dominated women's surfing consciousness. <laughs> Every girl paddling out for the first time wanted to be like her. I wanted to be like her. Almost everyone in the audience here has probably dreamed of doing turns like her. Lane Beachley, she's the only woman to have won, or man, to have won six world titles in a row consecutively. Of course, she was the first woman in history to win seven. Uh, welcome, Lane. Thank you so much for being part of the Tracks Thank podcast. You. Thank you. For those tuning in at home, we are broadcasting live from Kingscliff on the Tweed Coast. We're at the Seize the Day Festival. This is the biggest, world's biggest, all women's surf participation festival. How exciting is it, Lane? It's epic. <laughs> it is pretty cool. I wish it's... every event was like this. I wish every event had this much estrogen person to work. Me too. It's so much more fun. <laughs> um, so, Lane, of course, you have a role with Surfing Australia as chair. This is run by Surfing Australia. But you've also been incredibly busy since you won a few world titles. We will talk about all of it. Um, for n those not paying attention, uh, and you can miss it because she does so much, Lane travels internationally. She's a keynote motivational speaker. She's the founder of Awake Academy, and she'll be running a session tomorrow. So please do check the programs because that's one not to miss tomorrow morning. Um, she's the founder of Aim for the Stars. She is also an officer of the Order of Australia, and we're going to explore all of this and some of her work on success, mindset, overcoming challenges, but first, I want to address the elephant in the room. Where is it? <laughs> She's not here. I wish she was because it would be interesting. But there is a Trax magazine cover right there that has a new queen goat on it for so many years and forever. I mean, I grew up thinking no one was ever going to meet your record, let alone surpass it. Stephanie Gilmore did it last year. She won the eighth world title. How did you feel? What was going through your mind? I actually felt relieved, believe it or not. That's fascinating. Yeah, I know, because it was almost like I was holding on and defending something that I couldn't physically defend. And uh, there was so much build-up and all this conjecture around me and Steph and, and you know, first she matched me and then she's gone on to smash me. And that was always in, in Steph's sights. She always wanted to win 10. From the moment she came onto the tour, I remember standing on the, on the podium, or not the podium, it was kind of like the front deck of the athlete area at the Roxy Pro many years ago, it was 2007 and uh, I just come back after winning my seventh world title and I remember she declared to me at that moment, I want to win ten world titles and I went, okay, oh my you gosh. Um, but what's even more fascinating, I mean I'm in awe of her, I think she's incredible and she's a wonderful role model but what's even in awe is that there's a woman on the cover of Tracks magazine. I mean, that's How good is that? Let's get a round of applause. <laughs> It's definitely not something I was ever able to achieve in my career. Yeah. I'll, have, I'll right. have a word to the editors. I did speak to uh, uh, one of the editors this morning. I said, have we ever had Lane on the cover? No. And I think that's a, a sore point for me especially. I've only joined... <laughs> I've joined in the past few years, so if ever, I have anything to do with it, there will be more women on the cover. Excellent. But exactly. I was going to ask you about that during your career. You know, I mean, the, the representation of women surfers, and especially yourself, was it uh, at a level that you are satisfied with it anyway? When now? No, when oh, you were surfing. Then. When you won seven titles. Oh, that's you didn't get a cover. <laughs> What's going on? No, I got a cover of um, Surf Girl and Surfing Girl and whatever other girls magazine there were, but I was never able to grace the cover of a men's surfing magazine. And uh, look, Trax and I had a bit of a tumultuous relationship. I had, uh, I've been often referred to as the, the loose cannon of the surfing industry and that's because I always shared my opinion. I always spoke up for what I believed was right and uh, that wasn't really welcomed or encouraged in my, in my years of competing and um, I, essentially that's what I think also attributed to my feeling of being chewed up and spat out by the industry. Uh, that's just my interpretation of events but um, there's always room for improvement. And I was really grateful that we had women's surfing magazines back then and that we drove the, the direction for women's surfing and that we paved the way for the current generation to benefit from that. There's no question that the current generation also had their fair share of challenges and they're gonna have to continue paving the way and changing the landscape. 
there's a generational hangover of what is deemed to be right or wrong in regards to how women surfing should be represented or portrayed or promoted. Mm. But ultimately that comes down to the athletes standing up for what they believe is right and, uh, and pursuing a direction that they think is actually shining a light on the beauty and the grace and the style that women bring to women surfing and not conforming to what the industry thinks that we should look like or should behave like or should surf like. Mm. Um, so, if we get enough likes and comments on this Instagram live, do you think that we can get a swell of support for Lane Beachley on a cover now? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's do our best. I think there's. Would you buy the mag if you saw me on the cover? Would you buy the mag? I'd buy the mag. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Look, it's not like uh, Wendy Botha on the cover of Playboy, it's me on the cover of Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll bring a photographer up to uh, Freshy and we'll get you in the water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> back to Steph Gilmore though, like she roared onto the championship tour. You just mentioned 2007. She won her first title in her first year. I think you've said to me before, what a freak. Did you know then that it was going to happen, that yeah. she would beat you? based on her confidence and her composure under pressure and her raw talent and ability, there was no question that she was going to be a formidable force. In saying that, I never, uh, I never really projected far enough to predict what Stephanie would produce. I just knew that she was going to be incredible. Yeah. And uh, she's gone on to prove that to the whole world. Mm. Uh, she's a, obviously a very talented surfer. She had the advantage of growing up on Snapper Rock, at Snapper Rocks on the points there. She had the advantage of being surrounded by incredible surfers like Meek and Joel and Dean. Mm. She had uh, a great, what I refer to as a dream team around her, which I'll be speaking about tomorrow at my session. And, uh, and she really made the most of every opportunity that was presented to her. The difference between me and Steph is that she is naturally talented. <laughs> I, don't, I would not say I was naturally talented. Well, how did you get your talent? Just work really hard? I've just committed myself to it. I mean, I taught myself how to surf. I, uh, by the time I was number two in the world, I actually couldn't jump to my feet. I had, I had this three-step process that really sabotaged my, uh, my ability to perform in waves that were of consequence or hollow. And uh, I had to go back to the drawing board. So in 1995, I was number two in the world and, and, uh, and this close to becoming a world champion and had all the dreams and ambitions and desire and motivational affirmations and all the great people around me. But my talent was just holding me back my inability to get to my feet was holding me back. And so I found a surf coach, and uh, it, actually Pauline Messer introduced me to her surf coach, because I went and found other world champions. I was like, who do you work with? Who's helped you get to where you are? She introduced me to a, a young man called Steve Foreman, and uh, Steve basically agreed to meet with me, and I came up to Brunswick Heads, where he still lives, and I said, Steve, I want to win a world title, but I've been told I surf like a crab. And he went, okay, well I'm willing to help, but what does, what does a crab surf like? And I went, I'll come show you. So I paddled out and I caught a couple of waves and he called me back in. He's like, okay, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is I'm willing, willing to work with you. The bad news is yes, you surf like a crab. And everything that you now know, you're going to have to let go of and start all over again. Oh my gosh, so how you, hard is that? Well, when you're number two in the world and you want to become number one and you've just been told that everything you do is holding you back, not projecting you forward, are you willing to let go of that? And mm. that comes down to the trust that you have in your dream team or your coaches, the, the trust and the confidence you have in your ability and your capacity to l let go and learn. Mm. And that's what I had to do, a lot of. Amazing. So, so much so, I had to, and this was back in the days when our fins were glass fins, by the way, kids who probably weren't even... I learned to surf on a glass thin, thin board. Yeah, yeah, this old thing. I don't know how it even floated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing is that when we surf on glass fins, it means we travelled with glass fins, which means the fins were often knocked out when we arrived at, uh, at events and we had to have um, solar res and you know, resin and glass to repair our own boards all the time. But uh, I had to find a board. I borrowed a board from Pam Burridge that didn't have fins in it. I put it on my bed and I practiced jumping to my feet several times a day. And then I would go to a contest, I'd put on my contest jersey, I'd be down on the sand, ready to paddle out, I'd literally be practicing jumping to my feet. Because I had to unlearn 25 years of what I had known. And uh, actually no, I was only 24. 
<laughs> and uh, letting go of, you know, relearning all those new skills uh, required a lot of unlearning. I think a lot of people wish they could surf like you in their entire lifetime, let alone in 25 years. Um, and so I want to take you back to when you started surfing. Interesting, you've mentioned a lot of heroes that I think we would know in the room, but did you have a hero when you started? What made you want to become a champion surfer? I've never had heroes because the, the premise of having heroes means that you put someone above you. And the minute you put someone above you, you are now I guess, you know, you're lowering your own value and your own belief in yourself. I did have mentors. I had people that I drew inspiration from. So I drew on the inspiration of people like Wendy Botha, Frida Zamba, Lisa Anderson, Pam Burridge, Pauline Mensa. Basically anyone that had a world title, I wanted to be around them, learning from them and sucking as much information out of them as I possibly could. Yeah. So I travelled with Lisa, Pauline, Wendy, Pam. Tom Carroll, Barton Lynch, like I travel with every world champion, I trained with world champions because when you surround yourself with experts, it shortcuts the struggle. Mm. If you're just continuously learning from your own mistakes, then you're making a whole lot more than you need to make. Were there any gold nuggets you remember from any of those champions, one that really stuck with you? The first one that comes to mind was I was surfing against Pauline Mensa at a, a, a wave in France called Biritz, and it's a notorious, pretty ordinary beach break yeah. <laughs> and back in the days uh, priority wasn't allocated we either had we always had a priority boy and it was anchored out the back of the lineup and you had to time your paddle out to get around that priority boy to come back in to then maintain priority so you had to time the sets to make sure you weren't paddling out when the step was coming because you were literally leaving the lineup for about three or four minutes to go and get yourself priority. Oh my gosh. And I'll never forget, Pauline went out and got priority, came back in, no waves came. She had priority for the last eight minutes and she literally paddled me up and down that entire beach for the last eight minutes of the heat and I lost because I was out of position or worrying about catching a wave that she could always just take from me. So I remember asking her after that heat, are you willing to sit with me and have a beer and talk about how to utilize, best utilize priority? And from then on, I was able to use it against her. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> um, but then in the later years, when our priority was allocated, and then the rules changed around the utilization of priority, mm. the best surfer that was able to maximize priority and use it against me every single time we surfed against each other was Stephanie Gilmore. Ah, yeah, right. <laughs> what do you think of the priority rules now? Would you have preferred to? operate under those. I much prefer to yeah. operate on those. Yeah. You know, at Huntington Beach, I used to have to paddle 100 metres out to sea and come back in and miss a wave and have priority. And for what? There's no wave left. So oh, man. priority allocation and jet ski assistance, sign me up. Oh, the jet skis, right? Jet I want a jet ski when I'm yeah. surfing out there. Um, I love the, the story about, um, you know, the glass <laughs> glass fins. I can't imagine how they'd operate now with the Qantas baggage handlers and those videos that go wild on social media. Uh, probably a few lost fins. But any other anecdotes from back in the day when you started on tour, how different it is now, how much more resourced it is. Uh, when you were on tour, I know I, you written about it in your book that there was, you were basically sleeping on hotel room floors, there was, you were paying your own way. How difficult was it? What are some of the challenges? Well, it was extremely difficult because there was not an industry that supported it. The governing body didn't respect it and their male counterparts wanted nothing to do with us. <laughs> so made it very difficult to earn a living doing a sport that you love when no one loved it as much as you did. And when I started on tour, I did the Australian leg in the first year. So I joined the tour fresh out of high school. I was 17 years of age. So in 1990, I did my first half year. And then worked. I was working part time in about three or four different jobs. And then in the 1991, I decided to go and pursue my first full year. And I think about it now, like I'm 18 and 19 years of age, and I'm just saying to my dad, all right, I'm heading to South Africa next week. I'll see you in three months. He's like, okay, where are you staying? I have no idea. How are you getting there? Flying. <laughs> okay, just call me. No news is good news, but reverse charge every week. Yeah. <laughs> so when I went to South Africa, we stayed in a youth hostel. We got off the plane. We had no idea how to get into Durban. It was a very, a, a much safer city than it is today, but it was still a dangerous city. And I dragged my board bag through train stations and bus stations to get into the youth hostel and then drag my board bag through um, puddles of blood. And that was because there was a stabbing outside the, ho the hostel that morning. Needless to say, when we checked in, they said, we advise not to go out alone at night because there's been a bit of, <laughs> 
uh, untoward behaviour. Um, so that was my first introduction to South Africa. Then I went on to England, and when I got there, I had nowhere to stay. We surfed in this beautiful little uh, coastal town called Newquay. And I worked in a local surf shop at Manly called Aloha Surf, and we had a lot of uh, backpackers or international travellers come through as workers, so I made lots of good friends. And I actually caught up, I was on the street, literally almost in tears going, I don't know where to stay because I don't want to sleep in my board bag tonight at the beachfront on the contest site. And I ran into one of the guys who used to work at Aloha and he said, you can come stay with me. I was like, oh, awesome, thanks. And he lived in this beautiful apartment overlooking the most popular pub in town. And I slept on a Jason recliner chair in the lounge room with a full glass. Luxury. Of yeah. Because so, the, the board bag was the sleeping bag otherwise, is that yes, correct? Yeah, okay, and you'd yeah. just roll it out wherever you were. Yeah. How often did you do that? Oh, several times. Yeah, right. Yeah, the board bag was quite comfortable. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> so, look, it was... Um... <laughs> different times, <laughs> I'd say. Do they give you a hotel nowadays or Serving Australia pull the t sort of well, purse strings? Well, I can the performance center. Yes. Yeah, down there at Pasadena. So that's where I tend to spend most of my time in the Noosa room. Yeah. <laughs> it's comfortable there. But today, it's a very different landscape. You know, the girls are, are competing for the same prize money as men, mm. the same waves as the men compete in. There, there's still some room for growth and improvement there, mm. especially mm. at the grassroots level that we're working really hard towards with Surfing Australia, such as hosting a festival like this. Yeah encouraging more people, especially more women, to get involved, to elevate, to celebrate and nurture each other mm. and just to have fun in the water. I think uh, when life gets too serious and we strip all the fun away from it, we actually lose our capacity to perform at, at our best. Yeah. So that's why I think events and festivals like this are really important to bring back the fun. For sure. And you just mentioned Equal Prize May, obviously a massive moment for women in surfing. You unfortunately came before that time. Um, well, actually, I, I drove the agenda. Drove it, but you never yeah. actually got to see the results while you were competing. You yeah. never got the prize money the same as men. So you are absolutely fundamentally part of that, driving that. Um, but did you ever feel, uh, like, when did you recognise that it's totally unfair? Because it was just the status quo back then that women were paid less for the same waves. Did you start to feel this was unfair? What yeah. sparked it? Has anyone heard of the, the, uh, the frog in the boiling water syndrome? Yeah, so essentially what I'm referring to here is that when we, we, we enter into an environment that, go that feels uncomfortable or, or just unfair, and you're like, this doesn't feel right. But then the more time you spend in it, and the more time you encounter that same level of either hostility, intimidation, threat or challenge, that over time becomes the norm. And it's like putting a frog in tepid water and it's like, oh, this doesn't feel right. And then as you warm the heater up, the warm up the, the water, it's like, oh, okay, I can get comfortable with this. And then all of a sudden you're boiling the frog and it doesn't know the difference because it's been in there for so long. Mm. That's what it became. It became the status quo. But over time, I just became so dissatisfied with that. But mm. that's what really motivated me to, to make a difference. Mm. I, I, I was so dissatisfied with how we were treated the lack of opportunity, the disrespect, the misogyny, the, the sexism, it was just, it was unacceptable. Mm. And we set the standards by what we allow. So if we're constantly in that environment and we're like, oh yeah, just treat me like that, mm. then we're responsible as much as they are. And we can't expect others to change. If mm. we want something to change, we need to change. Mm. And that's when I became the loose cannon because I'm like, I am not standing for this. I am not doing the drugs. I am not tolerating that behaviour. Yeah. I will not paddle out in those conditions. And I will not tolerate that we're paid half and just suck it up because I'm a female. Yeah. Like, that's not acceptable. And that's what drove me to then apply to the, to the ASP. I sat on the board of directors for 15 years. I applied to the ASP for a licence. I'm the only surfer in the world to have my own, own event licence. And I staged the richest surfing event in the world for 15 years. I doubled the prize money. I got women surfing away from men and put them in a really challenging wave like DY Point. And then I invited the I invited the top under 16 year olds from around the world to compete in a trials event that I paid for with my own money to then invite that winner of that trials event to compete against the world champion. And the biggest mistake that I made in year one in 2006 when I hosted the first one at Hamlet was I invited Stephanie Gilmore. <laughs> so, so she beat me in the final of my own event. 
uh, and then I handed her 20 grand US and then, okay, see you next year, I'll do it. You would have really liked it back in your own bank well, account, well, I assume, yeah, yeah. given you weren't getting too much prize money on the tour. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because <laughs> at the time, the prize money was 60 grand between 18 of us total. Oh wow! Yeah. So, what would you end up with if you won an event? What What 8, was the eight thousand? And the men? Uh, the men were competing for around three hundred or three hundred fifty thousand. Right. Yeah. yeah. But that's all right because you're a girl, so you deal with that. Well, I just, I actually did want to, I want to explore the, the journey that you went on to get that equal prize money, but I also wanted to just, I did a little bit of research, Lane, and I came across an interview you did with the Guardian in two thousand and five. Um, this is the, the comment you made when they asked you about the different prize money. I compare men's and women's surfing to lightweight and heavyweight boxing. They're both the same discipline, but they're very different and they require two completely different forms of participation. Men have a bigger muscle base and this affects their technique and weight dispersion. They have more power and therefore they can do more. The girls are closing the gap, but the best surfer in the world as a female will never be as good as the male. Do you still believe that? Yes. And so how does that play into then the equal prize money? Because, if you still believe in equal prize money. Because if you're just putting the, the premise around equal prize money to performance, then you're limiting your imagination or you're actually you're even limiting the effort that every single one of these women have put into becoming the best in the world. And my argument is these girls have had to work harder, they've had to train harder, they've had to sacrifice more, they've had to commit to doing more, and yet just because you're a girl you're expected to earn less. These girls have had to put up with a whole lot more to achieve just the same as the men, and yet they're, they're told to believe that they're worth less. And that, to me, is a complete load of bullshit. Well, it's, it's, I kind of think the analogy of the lightweight and heavyweight boxing is great because yeah. it's very different, but why is it worth less? You know, yeah, what? why is it worth less? We still do the same amount of training. We travel to the same places. We have the same expenses. And yet you're telling surfboards me... Surfboards still cost the same. I wish I got 50% off my surfboards, don't you? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That would be I great. I when I was competing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we've just... If we're just putting, and it's the same in tennis. Yeah. You know, the, oh, the girls only pay three cents. But the girls have to pay the same cost to get to where they're going, the same expenses to stay where they are, to feed their families, to monitor their children, to do all the things behind the yeah. scenes. Let, let's not discount what's going on behind the scenes to ensure that these girls can show up mm. to perform at their best. So I think we're deserving of equal. And yeah, in terms yeah. of the actual commercial side as well, the best known tennis player is Ash Barty in Australia. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the best surfers, I mean yourself, you were probably the best known Australian surfer for a very long time. Um, and to be paid, you know, 8000 per win, I just can't believe it. Um, also earning a third of what the men's world champion is earning as well. I was going to say, sponsorship, what were you getting? Well, I was earning... I was a six times consecutive world champion. I was on two hundred and around two hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year, which is good. I was on good coin, but I also know the men, the current men's world champion, was on over one point two million at the time. But I was apparently one of the highest paid women, so just tolerate that. So, right. So when I ripped my sticker off my board and walked away from that sponsor, uh, and I've never been sponsored ever since, and I, it was because there was a values misalignment. You know, there was there was not a strong vision. After I won my sixth one, my sponsor then said to me, Lane, we're worried about your motivation and uh, if you don't win again next year, we're going to halve your salary. So yeah, that's really incentivizing. <laughs> Thank you. I've won more world titles than your entire men's team put together, but you're worried about my motivation and the value that I bring to your, to your industry. Basically, they said, look, our males, they sell board shorts, you don't sell bikinis, so uh, we're happy for you just to, to leave. Oh wow, that's so interesting because I know there are a, a handful of surfers, uh, some who have been on tour or in the Challenger series who've you know, now chosen in this new generation to not go with sponsors that don't align with their values. I think that's a new generational thing. Do you have any advice for those young surfers? Absolutely, stick with your guns, stick with uh, understanding your values and living according to them. Unfortunately, because we came at a time, we were very fortunate, my generation, that we were at the beginning of the explosion of the surf industry, so we were beneficiaries of that. Mm. Unfortunately, what 
really coincided with that is that we allowed the industry to dictate to us who we were, what we stood for, what we needed to look like, how we needed to dress, how we needed to behave. And when we were no longer part of that particular sponsor or part of that industry, we didn't know who we were. And I think what's, what separated me from that pack was that I was always very values aligned. I, I always knew what my values were and I always lived according to them. And the biggest mistakes I made in my life was when I did not live according to my values. Yeah. And, uh, and when I sabotaged or, or compromised my values. So today that these girls know what their values are yeah. and that they're willing to stand firm in those values adds a lot more value to their brand and a lot more weight to the positions that they can then hold and create a lot greater levels of influence as they continue to progress in the sport. Is there anything different about this next generation? Obviously they have come through with the benefit of equal prize money, they have the visibility that you didn't have a women in surfing. Does that play into it or what is it about this next generation that gives them the balls to stand up to these big brands and say no? The boobs. The boobs, sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. The estrogen. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> the strength, the courage, the tenacity, the vision, what gives them the courage to do that is knowing who they are. And when we all know who we are, then we start setting boundaries about what we're willing to tolerate. And because we set the standards by what we allow, if these girls don't allow this kind of bullying or bullish behaviour to be dictated upon, then they set new standards. And by setting those new standards, they're paving the way for the next generation to do the same. I really feel excited for the future of yeah. women surfing. And I think uh, also what's changing is the narrative, not only from women, but from men. The generational hang up from men, you know, there's still that mentality of it turns to shit, send the girls out, but that's fading away now. And I see brothers, fathers, uncles, husbands, you know, going out and surfing with their daughters, sisters, wives. And uh, that fills me full of, of excitement and satisfaction because when I paddled out it was you're a girl get out of the water you don't belong out here now it's sometimes especially at our local um, there's a lot of girls out there sometimes we're outnumbering the boys and I just go yes <laughs> do you get Kirk out in the water is he a surfer no Kirk's not a surfer okay so. that's your thing now, I, it... I tend to teach Kirk how to surf and he almost drowned so I don't think I'll do that again I taught my I have very little compassion for him though. yeah <laughs> Uh, I taught my husband how to surf and we're still married, so it's uh, a real achievement, but yeah, there's been a few arguments. Um, so, <laughs> you are, it's, it's the one thing I'm better at than him. Um, you now, we've talked about a little bit about overcoming resili like resilience and overcoming challenge and your story. If anyone hasn't read Lane's book, I highly recommend you do. It is a little old now, but it is fascinating about your, your upbringing. Lane's actually adopted. Um, she, she lost... If I ever hurt myself, I would go to my dad and say, I'm injured. He's like, well, get yourself a bloody wheelchair or hard enough. You know, that tough love mentality. So that robbed me of a lot of self-compassion. And we can't give what we don't have. So if I lack compassion for myself, I can't have compassion for others. So the biggest lesson for me in my older years is learning to soften. And I've still got a long way to go, but I learned to have more compassion for me because then I can extend that to other people. And uh, otherwise I'm very quick to judge, very quick to criticize, very quick to strip, uh, you know, tear strips off myself and others. Mm. And that's not who I want to be. Yeah. So now I get to choose who I want to be because I've, I've learned how to be compassionate. As an athlete or as a competitor, I was tagged as having the compassion of a tiger shark. I, uh, I literally was on this relentless pursuit of success. Mm. I saw as there, everyone that got in front of me, I saw them as on the way, not in the way, and I would literally bite them, let them bleed out, and swim past. Like, I had zero compassion for them, and upon reflection, it was because I had none for myself either. Mm. So if, you, if you're looking to be your best, then start to work out and identify what does that look like? Who are you when you are your best? What character, what kind of character are you? Because Ben Crow, my dear friend, says it's our decisions, not our conditions, that determine the quality of our lives. And we need to start making better decisions about who we want to be and how we want to show up. It's very easy to become 
dictated to by external circumstances. I lost my mother when I was six, my, uh, my mother who adopted me. I then lost my stepmother when I was 30 to breast cancer. And then I lost my biological mother to ovarian cancer when I was 45. So I've always equated motherhood with loss. Mother, Mother's Day is a bit of a, a challenging day for me. And, um, but in saying that, I'm not defined by those things. They're part of me, they're part of who I am, and I tap into what I can learn from them and what I can take from those lessons to then share with other people because uh, I'm not a victim. And when I was a victim, that's when I was at my worst. Mm. And I think you'll probably go through some of this tomorrow in the Awake Academy session tomorrow morning. Um, but I'd love to know what advice you have for other people who have suffered in the, in the room, I mean, in the tent. Um, you know, we all go through trauma and, and suffering and loss. How, how do you overcome that what, or go th move through it in a healthy way? There's one thing I wish we taught in school, and that's life skills. <laughs> and I was in mathematics and speaking English to learn how to read and write. One really most important skill that we all need to learn is empathy. And that empathy needs to start from us. So if there's one thing I would give us, the one piece of advice I would give to every human being is learn to honour your emotions. If you're having a bad day, have a bad day. But you get to choose how much space you give that. And if you're giving it too much attention, it will consume you. So have a bad day, feel the sadness, honour the pain, honour the suffering, but then also honour the, the power that you have to shift that. Because if we deny it, we suppress it, it becomes a bubbling little cancer inside of us and then all of a sudden something will trigger us and it will blow up and we will behave in a way that is not congruent with who we are and who we want to be. Mm. Honour the fact that you're sad, honour the fact that you're in pain, honour the fact that you're unhappy, that's okay. And then ask yourself, okay, now what am I willing to do? How much space am I willing to give this? And then what choice am I going to make about this? Because mm. last week, for example, I was out surfing at Freshie and I was having a really bad session. I was getting caught inside, I was falling off, I was really depleted with energy. And then I started tuning into all the excuses that I had about that. I'm tired, I'm worn out, it's been a big week, just having a bad session. And I thought, you know what, it's true. I am tired and I am worn out, but I can change this session. I can turn this session around. So I choose to now go and put myself in a better position. I now choose to be more patient. I now choose to take a deep breath between each wave just to calm down my central nervous system. I choose to tap into all the little hacks and skills that I've learned as an athlete and as a human being to apply those to now because I don't want to have an hour of a shit session. Yeah. I'm only going to have 20 minutes of it and then I'm going to turn it around. And from then on, I was able to turn it around. I got another incredible both. I always get my fair share, don't I? I, do. I get my fair share of ways out of Freshie. And, um, and I've I'm been out of Freshie and you've paddled yeah. inside me. No worries. <laughs> I'm one of those. But, uh, but I was able to turn it around because I honoured how I felt and then chose to feel something different. Yeah, I actually watched one of your Instagram videos the other day where you were talking about this and Lane talks about, you talked about how crying was a good release for you. Oh, yeah. So I was on the golf course last weekend and I don't know if you've ever taken up golf, anyone here, I've only just started playing, but it can be very frustrating. And I did have a little cry at the ninth hole and then I got back and I was good. I was on par for the last nine. It's literally, yeah. It's <laughs> it felt party. so much better. It's a party, 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 so when I used to come out of the water having not won, I would cry my eyes out. Yeah. And I was conceived, or well, sorry, conceived, I was conceived <laughs> as being a sore loser. Yeah, right. But what I, my competitors, and nor did I truly understand, is that my sense of self-worth was wrapped up in my results. If I didn't win, I was enough, nothing but a loser. Mm. And I didn't want to be a loser. So I wasn't being a sore loser, I was just being unconscious. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but that's how I released my emotions. Instead of doing a Sonny Garcia and belting my board against the judges' tower and throwing rocks at the judges and, fuck you guys, I would go into my car and bawl my eyes out and come out and go, okay, I feel better now. Yeah, get a bit of energy out, yeah. yeah. The uh, talking of um, surfing, back to the championships and the seven that you've got, um, what does make a champion? We have discussed kind of going through challenge and, and, and mindset what are the key elements that make a Steph Gilmore or a Lane Beachley? Well, I know Steph and I would answer this very differently. So but from my experience, what makes a champion is positive attitude, a really positive attitude, uh, because life isn't always going to go the way you want it to go. 
So you have to learn to adapt to those ebbs and flows. I think as surfers, we have the advantage of learning to adapt to change and surrendering to a force that's way more powerful than us. So attitude is really a, a positive attitude. The second thing is a dream team, because we've all stood on the shoulders of others to be where we are today. Those shoulders that you stand on to get to the top are the same shoulders you lean on on the way back down. So be conscious of how you're building relationships or burning relationships. I've burnt a lot of relationships in my career. Some of my peers will never forgive me or talk to me again because of the way I behave. And, uh, and I've learned to accept that. That's the story that they've created about me. I've, I've forgiven myself and I have more compassion for myself now. But that clarity of who I am and what I want surrounded myself with really good people who believed in me sometimes more than I believed in myself. And then taking responsibility for the actions that I take because it's our actions and our habits that will then determine whether we produce the outcomes that we desire. Mm. Yeah, great. Fascinating. I'm, I'm taking mental notes. Sorry. <laughs> Please, I need to record this while you clap. Um, so what advice, I guess, do you have for young women and girls? Who's a surfer here in the audience today? Awesome. How good is that? I remember not seeing many, right? Um, who want to become pro surfers? Who might want to start competing? You know, what, what, should they, what mindset do they need to take into the water? Ditto. Just what I said. Yeah. Yeah, maintain a positive attitude. Actually, I think the most important thing you can do, especially when you're entering competitive environments, is find your allies. Yeah. When I paddled out at Manly Beach, and for every one of those guys that gave me a hard time, there was always one or two that believed in me and supported me. They became my allies. So today, I still do it. When I walk into a boardroom and I'm in an environment where I'm the only girl in the all-male room, I will find my allies. I actually build those relationships before I even walk into the room. So in yeah, the cool. event that I lose my confidence, and lose the courage to say what I want to say, I give them almost the authority to speak on my behalf and back me up. Yeah, awesome. Because sometimes we don't always have the confidence to go into those environments. Sometimes we don't always have the confidence to speak up for what we believe in. But if we've got allies around us that can do that on our behalf, then that reassures us that we're on the right track. Yeah. But they're also people who will hold you accountable and who are honest with you, who bring the best out in you. You're honesty barometers, and that's what I'm going to be talking a little bit about tonight. Honesty barometers, I love that. <laughs> um, and your daily routine now looks a little different. You're still getting the surf, I but you've know. got like a multifaceted career. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What's a day in the life like now for a seven-time world champion? Every day is different. I, I wish I had a regular day, but I really don't. Yeah. Because last last week ago, <laughs> I don't even know what the day was, <laughs> third of, I think it was the 3rd or 2nd of June, I jumped on a plane and flew to Tavarua. I went to Fiji. I was speaking at a conference on the mainland there in Fiji and I tacked on three days prior to go to Tavarua and go surfing out of cloud break. Happened to score a pumping swell, paddled out at 10 foot cloud break and I was scared shitless the whole time I was out there. I was like, I used to do this. What am I if you haven't seen the photos, they're amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. So but then I scored restaurants for the next couple of days. So I was very surfed out, then went to the mainland, uh, spoke at a conference at the Intercontinental down there on the Coral Coast. It was a, a small business conference called Nurture Her or Nurture Business. Then flew home on the Friday night. On Saturday morning, drove down to Crooked River Winery because my husband is a musician, loves to see live bands. Cat Empire were playing, so we had to go down to Cat Empire and watch them. Came home on Sunday and then on Tuesday flew to Perth and Perth and I presented at a the Real Estate Institute of Western Australia. Yeah. So I presented to a bunch of real estate agents. They think they're rock stars, but then I introduced a real rock star, which is uh, Perth being really going to excess. Yeah. And then flew home, got home late on Thursday night and came up here Friday. So uh, that's the life of a seven times world champion who's a motivational speaker, a chairman of Surfing Australia, director of Urban Surf. I have my own business called Awake Academy. I am also caring for my dear old beautiful dad who has dementia. Um, and fortunately my siblings and I are you know, pulling a heavy weight to keep him out of a home. I want to keep him at home and independent for as long as I can. So there's a lot on, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm an ambassador for the Black Dog, Black Dog Institute uh, for Are You OK Day. I've been through my own mental health challenges. So I like to share those publicly to let people know that we're not alone in their struggles. And at the end of the day, the one thing that keeps me centred and balanced and connected and calm is surfing. 
and being on the Trats podcast, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, like, sorry for cover. Yeah, well, uh, if, um, if my editors are listening, uh, oh, we're, sure. let's put in a little note there. Oh, Flame, we've heard enough of you well, <laughs> not being on the cover of Trats. I get it, it's okay. If I have anything to do with it, there'll be something uh, coming up. But it'll it, be the master's edition. <laughs> I am going to say goodbye to our podcast listeners now. We are going to have time for the audience to have some questions. But thank you so much to everyone for thank tuning you. in. Um, and thank you, Lane, for being part of the Tracks podcast. Thank I'm you. Kate Orman. I'll see you later. Uh, to everyone, everyone here live. Um, yeah, clap. Thank you.